thank you po and uh, good afternoon to everybody uh, after a relatively long hiatus uh, it seems like uh, we had an advanced Sunday and thank you for being uh, all here today and let me acknowledge also the presence of my colleagues in the project uh, engineer and Tech and professor uh, Kim uh, Arias uh, I was hoping that some of our partners from the LGUs would uh, be here. They know that uh, we had uh, started our seminar series, series since uh, the other week uh, with the uh, lecture of Professor Balyaran. But uh, as you know, uh, we have been declared as uh, one of the municipal, one of the provinces you know, uh, under the state of calamity of the recent uh, impacts of uh, the monsoon rains on Habaga. So uh, they're very, very busy you know, in uh, the local government uh, units. Okay, so uh, let me share with you part of uh, the lessons that we have gleaned from uh, doing uh, our project. It's a three-year project. Uh, and so the title of my presentation is really looking into uh, some insights, sharing with you lessons and uh, reflecting on the challenges from a dis transdisciplinary assessment of climate change related vulnerability. As you can see, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, it's part of a project entitled Building Capacity to Adapt to Climate Change in Southeast Asia. Uh, the outline of my presentation will follow this. Uh, first, I'll uh, say a little about the impetus, the catalyst for this kind of work, uh, research, uh, and then uh, introduce to you the research goals and objectives, uh, the approach that uh, we utilize, consequently the methods, uh, some of the significant uh, findings, and then the insights, lessons, and challenges. Okay, so uh, why vulnerability uh, assessment? First and foremost, we know that uh, we all feel already that we are confronted by the negative impacts of uh, these extreme climate uh, events. No? And uh, included here will be, of course, uh, loss in lives, damage in livelihood, as well as uh, property, disruptions in our everyday life. No? as exemplified by the disruption uh, recently that we had. No? It seems like many have lost their momentum for uh, the semester because of the prolonged uh, holidays. Um, health problems that come with uh, the disasters brought about by uh, climate-related uh, incidences. And of course, uh, the more biophysical part of it would be the damage in our natural resources and in terms of biodiversity. The other is, uh, it is also important uh, to look into vulnerability, uh, mainly because there's really a big range no, of differences in terms of people's resilience no, and their capacities to adapt to this impact. So uh, we felt that uh, it is imperative uh, to look into uh, the vulnerabilities of uh, people uh, so that we can have insight on uh, what can be done in terms of uh, variety in their capacities. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, the Philippines is part of this uh, project because uh, within the region, the Philippines is considered to be one of the most vulnerable uh, to the impact of climate change together with uh, some other uh, countries like Vietnam and uh, Cambodia. So just a preview about uh, the study, uh, let me give you a little bit of the project for those, especially for those who missed uh, the first lecture of uh, Professor Valleran. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our study is part of a three-year, three-country uh, project entitled Building Capacity to Adapt to Climate Change in Southeast Asia. And uh, there are three uh, study sites. No? 
We have uh, one uh, province in Vietnam you know, that is Tian Way uh, province, and then uh, another province in Cambodia, Kampong you know, uh, Sto, and in the Philippines we have uh, Laguna as the study site. However, it's not the whole of Laguna, and I tell you uh, in a little while why not the whole of uh, Laguna. So uh, it's really just a portion of Laguna. Unlike for Tatan Way and Kampong uh, Sto, uh, the study site are really the uh, whole uh, provinces. Okay? And this is the reason, uh, one of the major reasons why. Um, if you notice, for Campus Po in Cambodia, within the province, uh, there are only seven municipalities uh, and 82 uh, communes or barangays in our case uh, uh, within the jurisdiction of uh, this province. In the case of Phua Ben Way in uh, Vietnam, uh, the whole province is divided into nine districts or municipalities in our case, no? sa kanila ang tawag ay districts. And uh, within those nine districts are 152 uh, communes. In the case of Laguna, however, we have one province covering 30 municipalities with 676 barangays. So that is over and beyond in terms of if you compare it with the coverage of uh, our our colleagues from uh, Vietnam and Cambodia, masyadong malaki yung giving uh, coverage ng, uh, ng Laguna. So what we did uh, was uh, to take on a watershed approach in terms of uh, delineating the uh, study site. So uh, the proposed watershed included municipalities that have experienced uh, flooding and heavy typhoon damages in recent uh, years without discounting of course that uh, same uh, flooding, same typhoons were also experienced by the other municipalities. But uh, the other agenda is because the study site that we uh, chose also include uh, the dominantly agricultural areas of uh, Laguna. So from 30 municipalities, uh, we went down to uh, a study site of 12 and 16, instead of 676, uh, we only have 274 within the 12 municipalities but uh, with the barangay or the community vulnerability conducted by a team of uh, Professor Banyaran that uh, went down to 194 with the uh, uh, sampling. Okay, and uh, of course we know very well that uh, we have a lot of problems with regards to climate related uh, hazards, especially those that are uh, related to typhoons and flooding. You know? uh, one reason among others you know, is uh, of course the context of Laguna uh, within the Laguna Lake uh, Basin. Now why Laguna? So we know that the Philippines is vulnerable. Uh, but why Laguna? The selection of Laguna as a project area of the study was based uh, basically on two key reasons. One, uh, a study also mentioned that uh, Laguna is among the top 10 provinces vulnerable to climate change related hazards. Uh, but at the same time, the province have made um, headways you know, in responding to the expected risks of climate change and uh, subsequent disasters no, through its uh, development, adoption, and implementation of a DRRM. Uh, I may, if I may say, a uh, very good uh, DRRM program. No? In fact, last August uh, 7, uh, Laguna was awarded the Palasag Award. No? Uh, this is an award that is uh, given to uh, local chief executives. No? given their, uh, how good their DRRM and climate change uh, programs are. No? But uh, even if uh, we're already uh, on the road you know, into uh, improving uh, adaptation uh, to climate uh, change impacts and uh, disaster risks, no? 
um, Laguna as a province still experience um, huge damages from flooding, heavy rains, and strong rainfall. So what we're trying to say is that there is still a need you know, for um, talks about um, climate change adaptation and uh, disaster adaptation. So uh, our project, um, as it is, uh, it has a goal that is shared by the three uh, research teams from the three countries, no? and that is to build local capacities to adapt to climate change, especially in the area of vulnerability assessment and the analysis of uh, appropriate adaptation options. No? And the main objectives of the study on uh, the studies conducted are first to assess the vulnerability of Laguna covered by the three watersheds of Mabacan, Santa Cruz, and Balanac. So that is the first year of our project. Uh, that's the goal, that's the uh, objective uh, that we try to achieve. And uh, secondly, for the second phase of our project, uh, given the vulnerability assessment, uh, we wanted to identify and subsequently subject to economic analysis the adaptation options uh, that were identified given uh, the site's uh, major vulnerability. So what I'm going to share with you in terms of uh, transdisciplinary work is really more for the first part, not the vulnerability uh, assessment. And uh, these are the specific objectives, of objectives for the vulnerability assessment. One is to measure the extent communities and households are vulnerable to climate change. And of course, produce the maps no? uh, showing their relative vulnerability and to analyze the social vulnerability of local communities in terms of gender, ge geographic location, and some social, cultural, demographic, and uh, political economic variables. Okay, the approach uh, you already have in the title that uh, the label of transdisciplinary approach, but let me make some clarifications before we go to what is so transdisciplinary about our approach. No? Uh, when we're dealing with what I usually refer to as wicked problems, problems that are difficult to uh, solve uh, on your own, you know? uh, there are several approaches. Uh, the, the traditional way, no? the traditional approach is really by disciplines. We come from different disciplines and uh, a disciplinary approach would refer to the specialization and fragmentation of academic uh, disciplines. So each discipline will have its own concepts, definitions, and uh, methodological uh, protocols in studying very precise uh, domains no, of uh, competency. So like biology will have its own domain and so uh, you say that when you study a particular subject matter, it's biological research. And then sociology or uh, its own domain and so on and uh, so forth. No? But uh, what we have recently, because as we know, no, not one discipline can really respond to wicked problems like climate change. No? What we have done uh, more recently, in the more recent past, would be multidisciplinary uh, approaches. No? And um, following the discussion of uh, Lawrence, no? when you have a, a research agenda no? and you uh, put together different researchers no? from different uh, disciplines and they try to work together given that research uh, agenda, and yet they remain you know, within their own specific disciplines and apply their specific disciplinary uh, concepts and methods and protocols uh, without really necessarily sharing a common goal with each other that is multidisciplinary uh, approach. So you come together, uh, you have a research agenda like climate change, you, know, you put together in a team, supposedly a team, you know, uh, a number of researchers, uh, one from the biological sciences, one from economics, one from the softer uh, social sciences. No? But uh, each would just do his or her own work. No? And then they just come together, write the report. No? But uh, there is really no much integration of uh, the report in terms of coming up with integrative uh, methodological you know, uh, uh, processes. And then we have uh, 
you want to level up and you have interdisciplinary uh, studies. No? This is when uh, there is the attempt for concerted and integrated action no, by the researchers from different disciplines as a means to achieve a shared goal that is usually a common subject of uh, study. So for instance, again, a research agenda like vulnerability to climate change and uh, I'm using uh, our experience, we have somebody from engineering, we have uh, Mang Kim from uh, economics and I'm coming from uh, sociology for instance and we try to come together uh, with our own disciplinary trainings no? but trying to come up with common goals no? and objectives and really trying to integrate whatever methods we uh, come no? we brought with us from our different uh, disciplines so that we don't have a different conclusion from the point of view of the engineer or the point of view of the economist or the point of view of uh, the sociologist but rather an integrative uh, uh, conclusion. No? And then um, further up no, is what I again would like to borrow from uh, Lawrence, no? the transdisciplinary uh, approach. No? Uh, transdisciplinary contributions incorporate a combination of concepts and knowledge, not only used by the academics and the researchers, but also, this time, other actors that are beyond disciplines. Usually, in the academy, we're coming from different disciplinary Anchors. We come together at the most we can uh, come up with interdisciplinary uh, work. But there's also knowledge uh, that is not within the frame of our disciplines. And these are usually the knowledge uh, that is in the communities, in other actors uh, that are not usually within the frame uh, or the box of academic uh, discipline. So we have the private sectors, we have the public sector, we have administrators, uh, and so on and uh, so forth. So when you bring them in and uh, work together uh, uh, to come up with conclusions and perhaps recommendations, uh, but this time uh, bringing together the contributions of not only the academics but also uh, those beyond academic disciplines, then we are transcending disciplinary um, course. And this is not a case of just transcending in terms of getting uh, data from them. You know? uh, transdisciplinarity is also a full range you know, of uh, transdisciplinarity. One would be, you know, you engage people beyond uh, disciplines uh, because you need their, their, their information, no? but that's, I think, the simplest uh, time. No? But then there's, uh, there's the engagement that can go uh, beyond that, especially when uh, you talk about uh, trying to validate really if you know, uh, the contribution of science will work, no? given a particular agenda. Okay, so uh, let me go back to, with that, let me go back to our uh, project. So uh, where were we? Uh, I mentioned that uh, it was a three-year project. We are now on our third year. So the first year, we uh, spent doing the vulnerability assessment, and that's where the findings I'm going to share you would be uh, under. Uh, the second year was on economic analysis of the adaptations. We came up with adaptation options given the vulnerability that uh, we uh, established given the first year uh, research. And now the third year, uh, we continue to engage our partners you know, uh, from local governments and communities in now writing the proposals, their proposals you know, for their own uh, climate change adaptation uh, agenda. Okay? Um, so uh, the, the flow is really doing training together. So uh, this is a case where it's so exciting because we don't only do training for local partners, we also underwent our own training and that helped a lot because uh, 
then I understand better what we talk about when we when we when we discuss uh, benefit cost analysis, which is usually the arena of um, uh, the economists. No? And this is not a case where you know I believe Mom came uh, to her work, you know, with her BCA because uh, after all, uh, I'm not going to work on that. No? So this is really uh, learning. Uh, from each uh, other, and then we have some cross-cutting, uh, cross-cutting uh, concerns. No, uh, we ensure that uh, the social uh, and the gender aspects, no, would all be there from beginning to uh, end. No? and so uh, we implemented that by uh, engaging our local partners and various uh, stakeholders, uh, and. Uh, and then uh, for our framework, uh, this was shared by Professor uh, Banyarat already last time. Uh, our contention of vulnerability, uh, we followed Adger's uh, conceptualization that it is a function of exposure, uh, sensitivity, and adaptive uh, capacity. And we, uh, from my end, we also specified that exposure, sensitivity, and uh, uh, adaptive capacity you know, has uh, they have very strong social political and cultural character therefore we need to capture you know, this uh, characteristic of uh, these three components no? so in our case for exposure or hazard uh, we look at uh, exposure to typhoon and flooding and then we had some indicators no, for sensitivity and uh, another set of indicators for uh, adaptive uh, capacity. So, um, for sensitivity, we have indicators falling under uh, categories of natural sensitivity, human sensitivity, infrastructure, excuse me, infrastructure and livelihood, and for uh, adaptive capacity, it's uh, infrastructure, economic, technology, and social and human uh, indicators. Okay, so for the vulnerability assessment, uh, so this is uh, how we went. Um, we identify the indicators and the determinants of uh, these indicators for exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. So it was a relatively long process, a lot of discussions, a lot of fighting you know, um, among countries and between disciplines. You know, uh, because as you said, you know, uh, we tend to see the indicators that would fall under our disciplinary uh, training. Uh, the other challenge there was that you know we were we wanted to have some level of comparability and so we wanted to work within a frame of uh, similar indicators for Vietnam, Cambodia, and uh, the Philippines. So there were a lot of talks, there were a lot of consultations between and among the researchers, between other experts, no? and with uh, the local communities no? where we we did our uh, study. Uh, once we were ready with uh, those uh, indicators and uh, items, uh, we did the data collection. There were two main uh, surveys you know, that uh, was done for the assessment of the vulnerability. One was a household uh, survey. Uh, the other is uh, a community or a barangay level survey. So. Uh, Mang Kim was uh, the team leader for the uh, household uh, survey of uh, 600 uh, households within the study site and Sir Enteng was the team leader for the Barangay Vulnerability and uh, Mapping of 194 uh, barangays. Okay? And then we came together, um, well, uh, aside from that, we did a lot of qualitative uh, work, FGDs, uh, key informant interviews, in depth, because we didn't want to measure only the magnitude of vulnerability given the indicators. No? We also wanted to know why no, these particular guys, or why these particular sectors are uh, vulnerable. No? And then we came up with an integrated uh, assessment for the community and then for the household, and we did uh, mapping you know, and came up with explanations for that. And as I said, uh, 
cross-cutting would be the participation of our partners no? uh, beyond the academy. So given that approach uh, for the identification of indicators and the assignment of the weights for each indicator, uh, of course we did our assignment, reviewed the literature that has been um, studies that has been done in this uh, uh, area, uh, then FGDs and the informant uh, interviews. And then for the household vulnerability, uh, the uh, the, the method that was, uh, the approach that was used basically to measure the vulnerability of households was the indicator uh, approach. Uh, Mount Team added no, another very uh, economic no, uh, measure that is uh, vulnerability as expected uh, poverty and uh, she did a comparison of would the findings be the same no, uh, if you use the vulnerability, uh, the, the indicator approach versus the and then for the barangay vulnerability, uh, the indicator approach, we had mapping of 124 uh, barangays. And for the social part, the more qualitative part, uh, we did a lot of in-depth studies, uh, came up with some cases from those in-depth studies and uh, some sectoral FGDs. Okay, so uh, it's going to be one week of lecture, so let me just uh, run down some of the significant uh, findings. So. Um, this summarizes our uh, barangay vulnerability. So, if you notice, given the determinants, no, the number of uh, barangays that are vulnerable would change. No? In terms of exposure, only nine municipalities, uh, five, uh, sorry, five municipalities, and ten uh, barangays within those municipalities with. Uh, Barangay San Pablo Norte coming out with uh, 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 score of one, not sir, one. Uh, that means highly vulnerable. So San Pablo Norte of Santa Cruz. For sensitivity, that increased from 5 to 12 vulnerable municipalities, and from 10, we now have uh, 60 vulnerable uh, barangays with Pinagbayanan in Pila coming out as the most uh, as the most sensitive, most vulnerable in terms of sensitivity. Okay? And then for adaptive capacity, uh, all the more, uh, we have 12 of the, the all, all the municipalities were considered vulnerable, with the 60 no, increasing to 131. Uh, barangays. And uh, Ilaya Atingay of Magdalena, not even a coastal barangay, no, uh, coming out as the most vulnerable in terms of adaptive capacity. Of course, overall, we had San Pablo Norte. So, okay, so. Uh, this, the, these maps were shown by uh, Professor Badiaran already last time, no? but just to uh, drive home the point, the exposure would look like this in terms of their relative vulnerability, major yellow pa siya. Then it becomes darker given sensitivity and darkest no? uh, for adaptive uh, capacity. That's also why, if you notice, uh, more vulnerable, more barangays are vulnerable. No? Uh, when you, you take into consideration sensitivity and uh, adaptive uh, capacity. So this is the uh, picture for the overall vulnerability. So who are vulnerable? Uh, barangays and uh, communities. Hello, okay, sorry for that. Um, we did mention that an overall um, assessment which showed that uh, the exposure is really highest along the coastal no, barangays. No? But if you notice, we mentioned, well, Pinagbayanan and San Pablo Norte, they're high in vulnerability, uh, in, in exposure and sensitivity. These are coastal barangays, so not much question. But if you talk about uh, Ilayo Katingay no, in Magdalena, it's not even uh, a coastal uh, uh, municipality, then 
uh, you kind of question why is it that uh, it is higher in uh, in terms it lowest rather in terms of adaptive uh, capacity. Okay, so uh, it seems like what we found out is that. Uh, vulnerability is indeed a function of exposure of varying human uh, ecosystems or barangays in this case to typhoons and floods. No? With coastal barangays having a higher exposure to flooding and prolonged inundation. So uh, that was uh, quite obvious. No? However, we also saw some uh, very, very significant and uh, interesting uh, data uh, showing that human, social, and economic sensitivity to these hazards also uh, put in major contributions to overall uh, vulnerability. So let me give you just some examples. No? We found out that eight barangays within the study site were not found to be highly exposed. Okay? So in terms of exposure, they're not part of the top 10. And yet they're among the 20 most vulnerable barangays. So, what we're saying here is that exposure is important, no? but apparently overall vulnerability goes beyond just being exposed no? to these uh, climatic uh, hazards. No? Anibong in Pagsanhan, uh, Masapang and Anhaya in Victoria, they came out 10th and uh, 15th in terms of uh, most vulnerable barangays, and they're not even part of the uh, 50 no? most uh, exposed uh, Barangays, no? So there are these uh, bits and pieces of uh, interesting information that came out of uh, the study. And when you try to examine their vulnerability, uh, you, there is indication that their high vulnerability can actually be attributed more to either human, social, economic, uh, or infrastructure indicators of sensitivity and adaptive capacity rather than simple exposure, okay? Another, uh, I, I mentioned that in terms of uh, sensitivity, Barangay Pinagbayanan in Pila, that's uh, Pila, not the Victoria, sorry, uh, ranked highest in terms of uh, sensitivity, but it slides down to 79th no, in terms of exposure. See, so in terms of exposure, it's not so exposed and yet it is vulnerable you know, because of very high uh, sensitivity. And so the overall, uh, in the overall sensitivity, relative uh, vulnerability, rather, uh, it ranked uh, 18th. You know? So it's part of the top 20, not because it is highly exposed, but because of uh, its uh, sensitivity. You know? So clearly, Vulnerability is a function of its uh, sensitivity. No? Uh, I looked at some of the indicators and I found out that this is because of infrastructure uh, indicators. Uh, of course, the relatively high poverty. Uh, it is also agriculture-based, dominantly uh, agriculture. And uh, so it increases its uh, sensitivity. Ito, interesting. Barangay Daya is actually number two. No? Uh, in terms of typhoons, equalanya. We don't say naman that there's a typhoon in Daya, there's a typhoon in Los Banos uh, or in, in Batong Malaki. Usually equal, equal sila dyan, no? uh, But in terms of exposure to flooding, it is relatively low. It's not like uh, um, San Pablo Norte, uh, which the la last year, no? uh, this time, uh, because of the monsoon rains, no? Uh, we had them inundated for, we had inundation for I think four to five months, no? So uh, that that led to a lot of delays, no, in our uh, second year uh, data gathering, no? So diet is not uh, like that, no? It is very low in terms of flooding. It experiences flooding, but more like flash floods, no? Because of strong rains, and then they have some uh, some of their drainages, no? Uh, problematic, and so they have this uh, type of uh, 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 flooding, okay? So it's very low in exposure to uh, flooding, but it's uh, number two in terms of uh, uh, overall sensitivity. 
And a closer look at the indicators of its vulnerability showed that barangay diet is one of the highest in terms of malnutrition rates, which is indicative of high sensitivity to the impact of climate change. When you have disasters, you have malnourished people and children, most especially, who will uh, bear the brunt no, of uh, the impact. So that's what we mean when we say uh, they are sensitive. No? Uh, it also has very low adaptive capacity as a result of low scores in technological, social, and human indicators for adaptive capacity. You know why? You have to look into uh, qualitatively. You look into this because DIA is a special case. No? Uh, way back in 2009, it experienced a rapid increase no, in its uh, population and uh, number of households from I think a population of uh, a household, number of households at 5,000 initially, within a matter of, I think, six months, no, it ballooned to 25,000 uh, households. Because of the relocation uh, to clean up Pasig River, then Ondoy happened, no, and more people from Maritina and Pasig were uh, relocated to uh, by anyone on the NHA uh, uh, housing complex. So, and all of these were going to be under the services, uh, the social services within the uh, uh, local government unit of Barangay Dayab. So, uh, it's the carrying capacity of its social services no, who, uh, was threatened. Okay. San Isidro also in Palawan, it's uh, highly vulnerable also, not because of exposure, but because uh, it has many women-headed households, no? and it is predominantly agriculture no? uh, in terms of livelihood. Okay? In terms of sectoral vulnerability, uh, our ATEP studies uh, indicated that households with high incidence of poverty no? are really the most uh, vulnerable. But also, there are other characteristics that come with it. These households with low income are also relatively large. No? Uh, not only low income, they're also large, and then their livelihood activities are uh, easily affected by climate-related hazards and disasters, uh, namely because of agriculture-based livelihood, and uh, some of them are also, most of them also are seasonal and contractual laborers. No? So households with high incidence of poverty, those who are in agriculture, the informal settlers, and this is quite interesting because uh, informal settlers as a highly vulnerable sector was something that we had in the Philippines that they did not have in uh, Vietnam no? and uh, Cambodia. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, of course, residents near lake shores and or rivers. Okay? And uh, our in-depth studies also show that uh, women-headed households, uh, and we had we now have a growing incidence of elderly-headed uh, households coming out also as vulnerable sectors. Okay, now why are they vulnerable? The poor households they are vulnerable obviously because of low income, but also because they are less prepared, not based on. Uh, our household uh, survey. And usually, they are into livelihood activities that are easily affected, very, very sensitive you know, to climate change uh, uh, related hazards and disasters. No? And uh, they also have residences. No? They're poor, and usually the poor, we find them uh, in areas that are also highly uh, exposed, no? with residences easily affected by typhoons and uh, floods. No? either because of location, specific characteristic, malapit sila sa lake kasi yun yung mga public lands, yun yung pwede mag informally settle, or because also uh, of uh, the material, the make of their, uh, their residences. No? Uh, the agricultural sector has been found by so many studies as uh, highly vulnerable to uh, climate change related uh, hazards. Uh, we found some uh, very interesting uh, reasons for their uh, vulnerability. Uh, for instance, cost for their inputs increases after disaster. That makes them highly sensitive. 
uh, disaster response becomes uh, an additional burden. No? So when disasters uh, strike, they still have to earn a living. No? At the same time, their uh, source of livelihood is affected, and then they have to make adjustments to prevent the damages. No? So time and energy now of household members are divided, and it affects the level of productivity. And uh, available resources to cope is also divided. No? Uh, you have the same uh, step. You have, you have the same amount of money, but this time uh, you cannot put it all into agricultural production because now you have to uh, put into uh, uh, build it, rebuild it, no? damages at the domestic uh, uh, for domestic use. No? In terms of hazards, typhoon and uh, ty typhoons were discussed as more damaging. Uh, informal settlers, uh, they are vulnerable because uh, they have less resources for preparedness. They have very vulnerable livelihoods. They have light material houses. Uh, their location is a problem. Then because they are uh, informal settlers, uh, they have relatively low capacities to access the RRM services. It's really Less access to credit, so they have very, very low bridging and uh, uh, linking social capital. They may be high in banking, but uh, low bridging and uh, linking social capital. Okay, uh, for house, some, some, some uh, insights into the household vulnerability, 36% uh, of the households that were uh, uh, surveyed, you know, uh, can be considered as uh, vulnerable. A large percentage of these uh, households uh, do not have knowledge about climate change and its impact, and therefore uh, the implication here is uh, there is a need uh, to conduct information dissemination and education activities. And majority of these households also are headed by those working in the commercial and service sector and agricultural uh, sector. So again, uh, strategic move would uh, focus supposedly on interventions towards these sectors. Okay? We also have findings of gender and uh, climate change uh, vulnerability. It's going to be long, though, but basically what we want to say here is that uh, not the double burden ang mga uh, babae. No? Uh, gender division of labor during and after disasters show over-representation of women. Uh, this is usually most apparent in the agricultural uh, sector. Uh, there's uh, more refined uh, division of labor after disaster uh, strikes because before, when there's no disaster, uh, men can also do the marketing together with women. But when disaster strikes and there's a rebuilding that needs to be done, then the burden of the marketing now falls in the shoulders of women because men now you know, are uh, burdened with the rebuilding uh, part. Uh, in some of the areas, we found that some of the vulnerable uh, sectors in agriculture, like the crazers, you know, were predominantly women. That makes them vulnerable. And then um, non-productive work, uh, such as household chores and many caregiving tasks, such as caring for children, for the elderly, uh, this increases much for women after disasters, during and after disasters, but not so much for uh, men. Okay, so, uh, iba rin focus nila no? uh, with regards to uh, 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 what is important. No? Uh, sila. Okay, so conclusion. Uh, we found cross-cutting no, of spatially based and sectoral based sensitivity. We know that Lakeshore uh, residences and barangays are vulnerable, uh, riverbanks are vulnerable, uh, those within irrigation canals uh, tend to be vulnerable also and uh, tend to be sensitive to flooding. But we also have informal settlers within this geographic allocation. So it's not only geographic, but also because of their sector, you know, because of, their, of a specific uh, social sector. And there's a lot of variations in sensitivity and adaptive capacities of communities and uh, sectors based on the indicators. You know. um, 
the vulnerable groups, I did mention that already. Let me go to some policy implications, lessons. Uh, clearly, vulnerability is more than exposure. That's what we found. And uh, it is importantly due to the sensitivities and level of adaptive capacity of various sectors of our society. Therefore, uh, when we talk about vulnerability assessment, we have to ensure that we really have very, very good indicators no, for the social, the cultural, uh, the economic, no, and the uh, political. No? And if uh, engineer Balleran would not touch on such things, no, uh, or initially, uh, then collaborative work no, has to be done. Okay. Uh, collaborative work is necessary for vulnerability assessments. No? Uh, vulnerability is a complex uh, issue. Climate change adaptation is a complex issue and must be dealt with an, in an atmosphere of cooperation and openness to a variety of uh, solutions. No? And so a transdisciplinary approach, no? if I may say, necessarily would be the kind that may embrace this uh, collaborative uh, work no? and uh, maybe a very good approach no? for dealing with, uh, as I say, wicked problems like climate change and climate change adaptation. When dealing with, uh, I've said that already, uh, so uh, in order to be effective, this shift should be founded on clarifications of definitions, goals, and methods. This is a work in progress. We're usually used to having our own methods and when we say, for instance, gender, then you call uh, sociologists to work on it. Why not call engineer Valera next time? Now that he is so gender sensitive. I want to get on. Um, economics. economics. Economics people work given a frame of methods no? and analytical tools. No? But uh, it is a challenge for the economists to come up with uh, the infusing of gender, you know? how do you really genderize you know, uh, economic, uh, economic tools? Aside from, you know, uh, this gender, gender, and gendering is going to be beyond just having women, ensuring women as uh, respondents. Okay, so uh, it is a work in progress, and so there's a lot of work to be done in terms of collaborative work, not only in doing uh, 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 research that is uh, on ground, but also in terms of methodological uh, discussions. No? Uh, and when you do this, there's a lot of cross fertilization of knowledge and experiences from various uh, groups. No? Uh, and I uh, would like to say that uh, this should be uh, should be uh, a way of doing things rather than, you know, an interdisciplinary or a transdisciplinary research just for the sake of doing a transdisciplinary uh, research. In our case, vulnerability assessment is not an end to itself. It is meant, okay, to ensure that we come up with some very good objective basis uh, as to the kind of adaptation uh, options we, we can think of and discuss with our partners and what kind of proposals are they now going to uh, to craft you know? and uh, when they craft their proposals it's already anchored on uh, vulnerability assessment that we all own you know? Not, they have ownership also because they have been there from the uh, very start okay uh, challenges Arriving at common understanding via disciplinal boundaries is uh, uh, a, con it's a continuing uh, challenge. We have different jargons, we have different uh, uh, concepts, and so uh, the work of putting them all, integrating them all together. Uh, there are methodological uh, lessons to be learned, like for instance, um, somebody from uh, human ecology like me would be doing FGDs differently from how uh, others would be doing an FGD. You know? So and, and the whys behind you know, the, the philosophical underpinnings behind doing or conducting such uh, uh, such uh, tools you know, or those methods you know, would also be uh, it can undergo clarification and sharing. Um, 
when you go transdisciplinary, one of the biggest challenges, really, if you are from the academic, no, is engaging uh, the local government. Engaging is not a problem, but engaging them within the frame no, of each other or our frame in the academy may pose some uh, challenge. No? Their timeline is different from our timelines, our agenda is different from their agenda, no? and so it is quite interesting and exciting to come together and uh, continuously discuss with one another because then you kind of understand at the end that uh, well they're coming from a different life no and uh, of course corollary to that is uh, us we don't we don't naman, uh, want that they just will adjust to our frame no uh, there's also the challenge of us doing our work in the academy but adjusting also to the frame of the LGUs as well as uh, the agenda of our local communities. So with that, that's our team and uh, some from our uh, Cambodian and uh, Vietnamese uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, this was taken and, and uh, this was taken in Huey, uh, Vietnam when we did our one of our trainings there. And uh, we have, of course, that's me, that's Professor Kim. And this is Mamiria of Circa. This one is uh, from uh, local government. So we brought our local partners uh, with us. Thank you.